Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. It's always a great honor to have Dr. Brian McVay back. And we are launching a series on his new book on what does a positive psychology and psychotherapeutics based on Julian Jane's ideas look like? So Brian, please take it away. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Shrikan, and thank you everybody um, for coming today. Okay, so uh, so today's talk, as you can see, the uh, title, The Positive Psychology of Julian Jaynes, The Basics of a Jaynesian Psychotherapeutics. So I know that some of you have perhaps been to my talks before, some of you, this may be the first time, so some of it, some of the ideas may make sense, some may not if you're new to this, and of course that's okay. Um, just ask later on, uh, and I'll try to clarify anything that is not clear because there is gonna be an assumption on my part that basically we're familiar with what James had to say. But as I said, I'm more than happy to clarify anything that um, does not make sense uh, to you. So, what does this mean, a Jamesian psychotherapeutics? Jane's, of course, is best known for his theory about a change in human mentality about 3,000 years ago. But what I'm interested in doing is showing that actually Jane's uh, rises to the level of uh, a philosopher. And what I mean by that, he had something to say about a whole range of different fields, including how the human mind heals itself, or what I call a Jamesian psychotherapeutics. Now, James himself never really developed uh, a psychotherapy, but there are a few intriguing quotes uh, in some of his writings where he implies or suggests that somebody should take this up. In other words, someone should take his ideas specifically his ideas on the nature of consciousness and show how if we understand the nature of consciousness, we can figure out how to better heal the human mind. And when I say heal the human mind, I don't necessarily mean in a strictly clinical situation. I'm also talking about uh, non-clinical situations where we all need a little help getting through the day or getting through the week. So this is, in a sense, about personal growth. It's, it's, this is not just about psychotherapy strictly defined. So I want to be clear about that. So uh, the other thing uh, in, in the, uh, just along the lines of um, introduction um, this idea of positive psychology, and I'm sure many of us are aware of what that means. Traditionally, when psychology first developed in modern times, the idea was that there was something wrong with the individual. The idea is that we have to find uh, some sort of psychopathology within the individual and fix that psychopathology in order to make the person get better. But there's another track of psychology that has developed that's called positive psychology. And the idea here is that whatever heals a human mind or however it, it, it heals, it comes from within. And that people are naturally resilient. People have positive features about them that they can use as tools in order to grow personally and in order to repair uh, th their minds when uh, they go as astray. So it's a very, the positive psychology takes a very different view from um, other certain uh, types of psychology we might say. Uh, so so that, that, that's one thing I'd like to say, what I mean by positive psychology. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out, which will, it may, may not make much sense now, but as I go along today, hopefully it'll make more sense. This idea of what some researchers call common factors. And common factors is uh, concerns an attempt to find out 
what is it about the human psyche that we all share that allows the human psyche to heal itself? And uh, many researchers have come up with sort of a list, I suppose, of common factors, things that they think must occur in a clinical setting to allow a person uh, to get better emotionally, psychologically, mentally. And the reason why I'm mentioning this idea of common factors is because I think consciousness itself should be added to that list of common factors. In other words, consciousness as defined by Jane's, in fact, we might call it Janesian consciousness to be clear, or conscious interiority to be clear. Janesian consciousness is a collection of active ingredients that allow the human psyche to heal itself. And if we can identify what exactly those active ingredients are and cultivate them for people who are suffering with a mental disorder and for people who are not suffering from a mental disorder, but just want to be a better person, who just want to be emotionally more healthy. And if we can do that, I think, um, uh, it, it, it can, uh, we, we can make a, a difference in, in the, the world of uh, psychology. So, th so this is not just about psychotherapeutics. This is about um, uh, the, the human psyche in general. So th there's th th uh, different applications here. So let me... Um, So that second slide, I'm not sure what's showing up because I have different things showing up. It, uh, it's it's a picture of uh, Julian James in the middle with uh, two pictures on. Okay, either. yeah, I, I don't understand why, but something is missing. Um, it's supposed to be. Um... Okay, now now there is uh, text on the top. Okay, all right. Um, I I thought I was more familiar with uh, PowerPoint, uh, but uh, apparently. Um, I'm being a bit challenged here, but in any case, so what I want to do today in order to explain why I think there is potential to develop a Janesian psychotherapeutics is to talk about the, the foundations, or you might say how to lay the groundwork for a Janesian psychotherapeutics. And of course, there are so many directions to go in. There are so many things to talk about. It's really a challenge to narrow things down in a way that is organized and coherent. And so if, <clears throat> in order to make my arguments. So of course, this will not be able to be accomplished today. This is really a long, um, a long term plan, but I at least want to get the ball rolling. And that's what I'm trying to do today. And I just want to introduce the foundations, as I said, and I'll introduce about half a dozen different um, facets or angles that we can look at in order to appreciate how Jane's understanding of the nature of consciousness um, can have some, once we understand what those the, the nature is, it can have some benefits. Uh, Brian, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. So I, I am very excited about this book of yours, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I think Julian Jaynes has identified something really fundamental about human beings. And it was groundbreaking when he discovered that. But really, the, you know, only when you apply those ideas to your life, you can get the maximum value out of it. And one of the applications is to understand the past. And most people have spent a lot of time on that. But what you're doing is they're saying, okay, what does this mean for us as individuals um, and as individual human beings? Also, I like your identification that this is really about personal growth. This is not exclusively, I mean, everything that you're saying is that you're identifying the core ideas of Julian Jaynes and saying, okay, how can this be applied to individual life? And to a large extent, an individual himself can apply uh, those things. So I think it's kind of personal growth and psychotherapy combined. Uh, is, is that fair? And, and um, it's a very large enterprise. So you have the whole book 
Um, so folks, uh, Brian has written a whole book on this and it is with the publishers and publishers are very, very slow. So we don't know exactly when it's going to come out, but this is like, we're, you know, Brian is going to do this series of meetups on the book, covering the areas that the book covers and flesh it out. So it's, this is going to be a series folks. So, um, so today is just building the foundation. All right, Brian. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And so um, thank you um, for mentioning all that for Kant, especially this idea of this is not just about mental disorder, mental illness. This applies to anybody because the challenge I think in clinical work is that oftentimes there's a gray area between um, a, a clearly diagnosable mental disorder and then someone who is just struggling through life. And we don't want to overdiagnose, but we don't want to ignore people who just need a little counseling, a little help. And so I think a, a good clinician is always um, looking at that gray area and not making judgments too quickly, but at the same time having an open mind that um, perhaps this person does not need a diagnosis, but they certainly need someone to talk to. So, uh, so to continue, um, if there's a, a take-home message from today's discussion, uh, what, what that should be is that consciousness itself, whatever that is, and again, we can talk about that in more detail later because it does get a little bit complicated, but whatever James meant by consciousness, consciousness itself is an active ingredient in how the mind can repair itself. And consciousness itself, this is where it gets a little, little more complicated. And if you look at number two, it's laid out there, the inherent self-healing potential of the features of conscious interiority, what I call uh, foci for short. Um, consciousness, it's, it's a bit challenging because we have to understand the different aspects of it. And people often ignore that part of Jane's book. You know, they want one simple definition of consciousness, but James does not give a simple definition of consciousness. He lays out about six or seven key features. And I've elaborated this to about a half a dozen different features. And so that's what the features of conscious interiority uh, is all about. And when it comes to th this idea that consciousness is, uh, uh, can act as the active ingredients in healing the mind, in order to push that agenda, we have to know what the features or what the facets of conscious interiority actually are, or else it becomes very vague. It doesn't make much sense. So in any case, if anyone has any questions about what these, what the features are exactly, of course, we can talk about that. But I just want to mention that now. So again, to just uh, circle back and reiterate, the take home message today should be that consciousness interiority itself is an active ingredient in how the human psyche can heal itself and how it can improve itself. So uh, the next uh, feature, number three, the role of mental imagery in healing in everyday life. So for number three, I'm just being a little more specific about the features of conscious interiority. Mental imagery, in fact, is a feature. It's one of the features of mental imagery. And for those of us who have worked in the field of mental health, we'll know, you know, we know that um, mental imagery is a very common tool in the toolbox of trying to help people um, heal. And of course, we use mental imagery in everyday life. And I don't want to talk about it too much uh, today. Uh, I, I, some other time I could do that, the role of mental imagery. But I just want to mention it as a, a specific example of um, uh, to, 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 to clarify, uh, to give an example of one feature of conscious interiority. So, uh, so to continue this idea of laying the foundations of uh, opening different doors that might lead to a better understanding of what James had to say about consciousness and how it can heal the human mind. Um, <clears throat> number four, I think it's pretty straightforward, this idea of hypnotherapy. Uh, to put it simply, hypnotherapy it might be defined as 
suspending subjective introspectable self-awareness, which is just a, another fancy way, I suppose, of saying conscious interiority, to increase suggestibility. And the idea here is when you increase suggestibility, it's easier to improve uh, a person's habits. It's easier to get rid of bad habits. It's easier to change their thinking. It's all about self-improvement, self-change. So with, hip, with hypnosis, the, what's important to keep in mind about hypnosis is that we actually know an awful lot about hypnosis. There's been a tremendous amount of um, research on hypnosis. And of course, hypnotherapy is a tool that many clinicians use uh, in order to help their clients and patients. And James has a whole chapter on hypnosis in his book. So what's significant about <clears throat> hypnosis is that despite all our knowledge about what it can do, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as things stand now, we don't actually have a theory on what hypnosis is. We don't really understand why it's supposed to work or why it does work. There are some... There are some theories, of course, but none of them really um, are very persuasive. They're just different parts of, of a larger theory that we need in, un, in order to understand why hypnosis can occur in the first place. And James, in his book, as I said, he has a chapter devoted to it. He fits hypnosis into a larger theory of consciousness. And uh, to my mind, he's really the only theorist who has adequately explained in a scientific manner why hypnosis can occur in the first place. And, you know, hypnosis does not make much sense unless we understand the nature of consciousness. And once we understand what consciousness is, then we can understand how it is suspended. So I'm not going to talk about hypnosis uh, today, but I just want to mention that again to kind of step back and give a different angles and to invite people to consider how rich and how um, how deep um, Jane's contributions are when it comes to understanding the nature of consciousness. So to move on to number five, the use of metaphors to reframe and better process our experiences. So this is something that I've talked a lot about before. I've written about metaphors. For Jane's the, the Jamesian consciousness, of course, relies on metaphors, and James spent a lot of time talking about metaphors. Uh, he was not the first, of course, to talk about metaphors, but um, certainly his idea of how linguistic metaphors are vital to the cultural construction of consciousness is a very revolutionary idea. Um, so I'm not going to talk about metaphors today, but I just want to, um, again, give any give, give an example of what James had to say and how this all relates to um, consciousness. And again, clinicians uh, <clears throat> many times rely on metaphors or they ask a client to please come up with a metaphor to explain your pain. Please come up with a metaphor to articulate your thoughts about something. So metaphors are, again, they're not just a literary device to make language more colorful. Metaphors are the basic building blocks of how the human psyche works. And the, the, increasingly, more recently, there's been a lot of writing um, in uh, psychotherapy that sees the value of metaphors. And in my own practice, I always uh, try to uh, uh, encourage uh, clients to come up with metaphors that they think may be useful in order to help them express their ideas or in order to help them reframe uh, a, an experience and to look at it from uh, a different angle. And then finally, <clears throat> the last angle of a, what we might call Jamesian psychotherapeutics, there are actually a few other angles, um, but uh, I, I won't go into them today, but number six, this is maybe a little more difficult to understand and I won't spend too much time on it, but uh, emotions, what are emotions? And James came up with this, uh, this idea. Actually, he, he, talked, he didn't really talk about emotions in his book, uh, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of Icon Mind, but he did publish an, an article 
on emotions. It's a short article, but I think very, very important, um, where he tries to look at the role of emotions in human culture from his perspective of what he believed consciousness is or what consciousness does to emotions. And very simply, he came up with what he called a, a two-tier theory of emotion. So two levels, two tiers. And the first tier are what we just might call effects or very basic emotions that most animals, especially mammals have. But the second tier is what happens to those effects when they are consciously interiorized. In other words, when consciousness meets an emotion. And according to James, Emotions as we experience them, and this is difficult for many people to get their heads around, I suppose, but according to James, in pre-conscious times, about 3,000 years ago, people did not experience emotions the way we do. Um, they did not experience what he would call conscious emotions. And the idea is, so what is a conscious emotion? Well, not to be too graphic, but think about the emotions or feelings someone has um, when they're sexually aroused or they're very hungry. For most animals, there's closure to that emotion. There's the, they, they experience a physiological response in their body. They go and they mate or they eat something and they're satiated and that's it. But for humans, because of our neocortex, because of our rich history of symbols and traditions and things are just more complicated in, 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 with the human mind, what happens is that, at that there's a second tier where we mix up our feelings with these basic effects and um, we don't have closure to our fantasies and our fantasies sort of lose, we, we lose control as it were. So uh, the idea is when it comes to food, for example, eating a meal for many people does not necessarily satisfy their hunger. They're still hungry. They still think that they're hungry. This is a simple explanation. Yet you really have to read the article for it to make more sense. And per perhaps I'm not articulating it as well as I should, but the idea here, according to James, is that humans, uh, because of, of, of culture and because of uh, th th this sort of th this cultural add-on of consciousness have more complicated emotions than animals do and that our emotions are more difficult to shut off. And so, for example, anger becomes hatred. Shame becomes guilt. And so that's what the second tier of emotions uh, is all about. Um, again, I, I, I'm not going to talk about that too much today. I just wanted to introduce it. Um, if anybody wants the reference to, to um, uh, the, the article that James, uh, where James explains his idea of, of consciously interiorized emotions, let me know. I'll, I'll be more than happy to uh, send it to you. But I just want to introduce that. So in any case, as I said, what I've done, what I did just now, as I laid uh, half a dozen foundational approaches to a Jamesian psychotherapeutics. And to, to actually to go back to number six, the reason why that's important clinically, and not just cl clinically, but also outside the clinical uh, setting is because um, of course, therapists deal with the emotions of their clients and patients all the time. Um, you know, Many people have all types of problems with their emotions, anger management being the most common. Um, and so the idea is if we, there's a practical aspect to all this, a practical angle. If we can understand the workings of emotions, we're more likely to be able to provide our clients with some psychoeducation and to show them how they can get their emotions um, under, under control. So I just want to stress that point that um, th th this is not just airy academics, that there are some practical implications uh, to what we're uh, looking at today. So. Uh, to move on to the next slide. So this talk, you know, it, it, I, 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 unfortunately, um, 
and it may appear that I'm sort of a little all over the place. This is not as, it's not following a, as logical uh, a train uh, um, of thought that I would like it to be, but uh, I'm gonna just sort of introduce some key ideas here and there, and hopefully by the end, it, it'll cohere and make sense. But let's begin by talking about um, the first aspect that I talked about in that list of six aspects of James and psychotherapeutics, which, which has to do with the what some people call the unconscious, the subconscious, uh, the non-conscious. There's a bunch of different names for this idea. Um, I Lately, I've been using the term, it's kind of a awkward term, but consciousless cognition. In other words, cognition without conscious, without consciousness. And what I just want to introduce and I'm, I'm not the first person to, to make this distinction. Many people have made this distinction um, between what we can call conscious cognition versus consciousless cognition. And consciousless cognition, one way to think of it is that it's fast, it's implicit, it's automatic. Whereas conscious cognition, or Jamesian conscious cognition, we might say, is slow, explicit, involved in deliberative decision making. Now, there are a lot of other characteristics and traits. Uh, Brian, that, can I ask yeah. you a question? Sure. Uh, go right ahead. So is this the same distinction or similar distinction that Daniel Kahneman makes between system one and system two? Yes. Yes. Pretty much. Yes, it is. Um, Thanks. Yes, it is. And, and in fact, I think those the, the words that I'm using, I think, are, are borrowed from the distinction he makes. Um, and I just want to point out that, um, that that's a wonderful idea uh, that he has developed. But, you know, there's a whole history of examining unconscious cognition or consciousness cognition. People usually think of Freud, but actually uh, before Freud, going back, I'm talking the 1870s, 1880s, the, some of the first psychologists started to study um, typing, the mechanics of typing, and to see how people could type so fast without being conscious of each key that they hit. And this, so, so we're talking about research that's maybe 120, 130, 40 years old. So, th so this distinction, it's not a new distinction. And the past hundred years or so, different researchers, different psychologists have called it different things. So for example, um, uh, well, I, I, you know what, I'm, I'm not gonna, I won't mention it now, unless, unless someone is interested. I, I have a list of other ways of describing other traits that describe the distinction between consciousless cognition and conscious cognition. The point I'm making is that this is not a new idea. This has been around since the late 1800s. It's just that different researchers have used different terminology to make this distinction. And this feat, this, this difference actually between consciousness and conscious cognition, I think is one of the key problems that psychology has struggled with. And many psychologists simply ignore it because it's the implications are so profound um, not, not all, you know, some, some psychologists take it seriously, of course, but it really, the, the point I'm making to repeat is this problem has been around for a long time. And uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, there was a spurt of very productive research where some psychologists um, returned to this, th th this idea, th th uh, uh, the difference between conscious and non-conscious uh, mentation. Um, and basically their conclusion, it's not surprising, is that most mentation, most cognition is not conscious. So in any case, um, and, and uh, I don't want to go into history too much unless somebody is interested, but just I'll just very briefly give some uh, context. You, you know, I think it's a, a worthwhile question to ask when did people first start to talk about the unconscious or the non-subconscious, whatever you want to call it? Um, really, even though people like St. Augustine seem to suggest there was something like an unconscious, in fact, to quote St. Augustine, he wrote about a vast and boundless 
subterranean sh shrine. Who has ever reached the bottom of it? Imagine the plains, caverns, and abysses of my memory. They are innumerable and are innumerably and innumerably and are innumerably full of innumerable kinds of things. Okay, so that's about 2,000 years ago. So people had a vague idea, but it really was not until the 16, 1700s that the word in English, in any case, unconscious was, was first used. And it really was not until the 1800s that people started to use it on a more regular basis. So I just want to give some circle context. And the reason why that's important is we have to ask if, why was it, well, how come it was in the 1800s that people started to really talk about, become interested in the unconscious? And I think it's because, as strange as this sounds, people were not really thinking about being conscious that much. <laughs> um, they were conscious, but uh, being conscious was not really a key issue until the 1800s. And then when they started to think about being conscious, they started to notice there were a lot of behaviors that they did not engage in consciously. And so there must be something going on non-consciously. So these two things are very much related, consciousness and uh, the unconscious. And uh, we have to look at history. We have to go back and we have to do our homework and see when and why did um, our understanding of the human psyche start to change. So in any case, um, uh, to, to move on. So um, as I said, the, the, the terminology it, it gets a little complicated. I mean, they're not complicated, but people have different ideas of what these terms mean, even though there is a lot of overlap. Um, you know, the, the, the issue with in English, well, I think in the Western world, in the Euro-American world, at least, when we talk about the unconscious, people think of Freud. Um, Freud had his own understanding of what he, the, the unconscious was, and it overlaps with the definitions of other people, but not entirely. So we have to keep that in mind. We should really uh, make a distinction between these different ideas of what uh, unconscious, subconscious, uh, what, what, what these ideas mean. But the point I would make to go back to a historical perspective is I, I make the claim that the history of psychology needs to be rewritten. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's an assumption that many people make that modern psychology um, is about the discovery of the unconscious. In fact, there's a very uh, famous, a wonderful book by the, that, that's what the title is, The Discovery of the Unconscious, The History and Evolution of Dynamic Psychiatry. It's a 900 page book um, and um, by uh, Henry Ellenberger. And uh, if anyone is interested, most, most of us are probably not, in, not interested in um, a 900 page book detailing the emergence of psychology, psychiatry. But if you are, this is the, a place to go if you're not familiar with this book. And he really tries to put things in historical perspective. Uh, in any case, they, they go back to why I think psych, the history of psychology needs to be rewritten. Because the psychology is not about an emerging recognition through the centuries of the submerged parts of the psyche. Rather, Psychology is about the discovery of, the, of consciousness. Why did consciousness itself become so mysterious? And once people started to discover that they had a, what we might call a consciousness, that's when they began to talk about uh, the unconscious. So in any case, that's just an attempt to put things in some historical uh, perspective. There's a lot I could say about that, but um, I, I just want to introduce uh, a historical uh, angle. So if right here we see Freud's uh, very famous metaphor of um, the iceberg, of course, and this is one thing Freud definitely got right, that most mentation is not conscious and 
uh, it gets at the submerged level, of course, un under the waterline, there's the different types of non-conscious mentation. There's the pre-conscious, then there's the subconscious. Um, there are many ways to talk about it, um, but that, that's, just, that's just one way to talk about it. Um, but in any case, just to add some clarity uh, to this the discussion, uh, Dennett has a really good quote here about consciousless cognition or non-conscious cognition. It is not repressed unconscious activity of the sort Freud uncovered activity driven out of the sight of consciousness, but just mental activity that is somehow beneath or beyond the kin of consciousness altogether. So I, I guess there's different ways to interpret that, but I think what he's trying to say is that the way I, I look at it is when we say consciousness, we have to be very careful right, when we talk about unconscious uh, unconsciousness, because are we talking about a Freudian perspective or are you talking about other perspectives? And there are some psychologists who take a non-Freudian perspective on what uh, consci non-consciousness means. Uh, and um, we have to keep that in mind. And again, I don't, we don't have to go into uh, the, the detailed ins and outs of all the different definitions, but it is, I think it's very useful, especially if we're talking about a Jamesian consciousness via V unconsciousness. We, we, we have to be open to the idea that um, Freud was not the only interpreter. His is not the only voice on what the what non-conscious uh, means. Um, <clears throat> so again, to, to return to this historical way of looking at things. So the real mystery, I think, is from a Jamesian perspective. The question is, why? Before the first millennium BCE, there is no evidence of conscious interiority, or what you might call conscious subjective mentality. That's really uh, the, the mystery. Um, the other point I would make is that non-consciousness or consciousless cognition is our basic primary default form of cognition. The mystery is not about the unconscious. The mystery is about consciousness. And if we look at the historical record carefully, like uh, James did, we'll see this mystery that before the first millennium BCE, there was no discussion of anything like consciousness and certainly no discussion of the, the unconscious or non-conscious. So of course, for those of you who are familiar with James, you'll know that for James, consciousness or conscious interiority is an add-on or a secondary form of cognition. It's a cultural layering. That's what I mean by the word add on that humans had to learn about 3000 years ago. Um, so in any case, this, um, the, 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 uh, 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 again, to sort of stay on this historical perspective, um, th there's a misunderstanding, uh, I think about Freud that many people share that Freud discovered the unconscious and that he Freud was the only one who developed the whole theory about the unconscious. But if you look at what was going on, at least in the Euro-American world, in the, especially the mid late 1800s, there were a lot of other people talking about what we call the unconscious, a lot of other people. And they developed very different ideas on what they thought the unconscious was all about. Um, and an example here, I forgot to put his name up, this, this individual with this, with the, uh, with that wonderful, um, beard, his name is Carl von Hartmann, Carl von Hartmann. He lived from 1842 to 1906. <clears throat> in 1884, he wrote, uh, philosophy of the unconscious. He developed an entire philosophy around this concept. And this is just one example of a pre-Freudian work that had tremendous influence around, uh, uh, around the world at the time. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm just using this as an example to make the point that despite all the wonderful contributions of Freud, he gets, I think, the spotlight. Uh, Freud, and I think, gets a little more attention than he deserves. 
and there are <coughs> many other people who develop, <coughs> uh, excuse me, similar ideas that um, unless you're an intellectual historian um, have been forgotten. And von Hartmann is a good example of that. So now let's look at things from a little more a practical point of view. Educating clients on implications of consciousless cognition. Of course, many people are very familiar with non-conscious cognition or subconscious, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> it's not an entirely new idea for people, but I think uh, at least in my mind, um, it's an idea I emphasize with clients, this idea and I, uh, of the importance, the role that consciousness cognition plays. Uh, and, and part of the, the psychoeducation is to show them that it's not just a Freudian understanding of, of um, non-conscious cognition. So the idea is to demystify mental operations. And by the way, what I'm talking about now, this idea, I say educating clients, not just clients in a clinical setting, but anybody who wants to know what they are as a creature of the universe, um, I think should really take these ideas seriously. Um, uh, because I, I do think that um, there, there, there's a lot we can learn um, about ourselves once we recognize how most of our mentation, most of our cognition is not conscious. So getting to know ourselves is as much a challenge as getting to know others because consciousness cognition is the most salient part of our psyche, not consciousness, not consciousness. Um, and there's a myth in modern times, I think, I, I call it the myth of open book self-objectivity. And the myth makes this claim that we are transparent to ourselves. And uh, for those of us who work in the mental health field, we know that th that myth can be a hindrance, a major hindrance in therapy. Um, uh, I mean, counseling therapy, it, it, psychotherapy is, is, is really about um, learning about ourselves, learning our defects and challenges, and also from a positive psychological perspective, a lot of our strengths that we have forgotten or that we're, we're not aware of for, for some reason. So, so the idea is how do we develop more knowledge about this, that part of the iceberg that is below the waterline? Uh, that, that's, that's, um, that's another discussion. Uh, you know, what, what are some of the techniques? But I mean, I think one thing I just mentioned now is to pay attention to what other people say about us. <laughs> you know, that's an obvious one, but um, I think that's a good place to start. So we can chip away at this myth of open book self-objectivity that I know exactly all the time what's going on inside my mind. That is rarely uh, true. And one reason why that's not true is because we're constantly changing and evolving every day. Every day when we wake up, we are a different person. The differences may not be major, but uh, but but there is but I think we have to look at ourselves as something as as a moving target, um, and we have to be aware of what knowledge we have absorbed, um, what how that knowledge has improved us, or perhaps how it, 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 it's keeping us back in in some way. So in any case, again, you know, the idea here I just want to introduce a more practical angle uh, to today's discussion concerning the importance of uh, consciousness cognition, both in the clinical setting and outside a clinical setting. So again, just to kind of throw some of these ideas out, um, uh, repression, th this is more or less a Freudian psychodynamic theory it's a, uh, about a, a defense mechanism in which distressing thoughts are prevented from rising to a level of conscious awareness. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, it's not that Freud was wrong about this idea of repression. I think he was right, actually. Um, but, you know, the idea, but I think the problem is sometimes um, it, it takes, a, uh, we have to be a bit careful. Uh, you know, we can't assume that everything is uh, repressed. 
Um, and, and, and so again, you know, there's a lot of value to this Freudian idea of repression, but uh, I think we, we have to be a little bit careful uh, with it. And I, I'm not gonna talk too much about that why, but I, I thought I, I would just uh, mention that. Um, and again, you know, it, it's fascinating when you have to look, again, you have to look at history. So most educated people are familiar with this idea of repression, but ask yourself, uh, if, if you do, if you look at things historically, 100, 200 years ago, did people use the term repression the way that we do so liberally? I doubt it. And I, I, you, I mention that as an illustration to show how even 100 years ago, the human psyche was a very different thing and how it, it is constantly changing and updating and using new concepts in order to keep up with, um, with economic changes, with political changes, social changes. Uh, so in any case, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so, and again, this is just a sort of nuts and bolts discussion, the difference between repression and suppression. So repression, unwanted impulses or thoughts being unconsciously pushed out of awareness, where a suppression deliberately trying to forget or not think about painful or, or wanted or unwanted thoughts. Uh, so one is not aware of what the psyche has unintentionally made non-conscious, uh, unlike suppression, uh, repression involves qu quarantine, qu quarantining unpleasant thoughts, feelings, impulses that do not subjectively register in consciousness. Theoretically, repressed material cannot be made conscious by an act of will. So what is repressed is accessible only through therapy. Well, not necessarily, but that's what many uh, counselors might tell you. Um, often that is the case. So the idea is repression is a is you might say push to use a metaphor push deeper below the waterline um, of, of the, the the iceberg um, whereas suppressed material can be intentionally recalled so many times repression in the clinical setting is associated with some sort of trauma some sort of very painful negative experience that a person is having a very difficult time um, talking about so I, I think we're, we're all aware of that, but it, it's worth putting some flesh on the bones as it were when we're talking about different types of non-conscious mentation. So again, to look at things from a practical perspective, acknowledging the role of non-conscious processes helps us recognize aspects of our own background and identity and their impact on others. So the idea here, again, this is not just in a clinical setting, this is also for people who are interested in personal growth to explore personal biases, preferences, likes, dislikes, because these are not obvious to ourselves many times. Becoming familiar with one's values, especially, especially if one has never explicitly considered what, what they are, or where they came from. Why do I have a certain value? Is it a good value? Is it out of date? Does it really fit in with my other, the other parts of my worldview? These are all the, these are things that of course can only be answered from an individual level, but I, I think they're worth mentioning. Um, <clears throat> so this idea of to explore personal biases. So now in therapy, there's a lot of um, talk of um, racial biases. Uh, and this falls under, um, multicultural therapy. And so, of course, there are many programs now that offer training in how to uproot or reveal personal biases that we may have about other groups of people. You know, we may not think of ourselves as being a very racist person, but there may be some racial ideas floating around our, our head that we're not terribly aware of. So the, the idea here is to try and, <coughs> excuse me, confront and elicit some of those ideas, which can be a very painful, embarrassing experience uh, for people who have undergone um, some sort of uh, diversity training, if you take it seriously. No one wants to admit that they're sexist or that they're racist um, or that they have some sort of <coughs> unconscious dislike of a, a person from a certain group. 
So again, we, we can see the practical uses here of... Um, Brian, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, what is, I mean, I see uh, conscious mind, subconscious mind, and unconscious mind. What is the distinction between subconscious mind and unconscious mind? <clears throat> well, um, that's a good question, but to be honest with you, um, I'm not sure uh, myself. I mean, I can see what that diagram says. That's not, I, I, I should mention, that's not my... Oh, uh, then 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 we can forget about it. Yeah, I just threw that up there. So okay. the, but but I think I'm glad you mentioned that because this is a, a good opportunity to drive home the point that you know there's we have all these words floating out there the conscious the non-conscious consciousless subconscious pre-conscious unconscious and people use them in a different in various ways and uh, this is just someone's um, opinion it looks very detailed I I just pulled that off of. Uh, Google images. So if anyone is interested, um, I encourage you to, to take a look at that. Um, so, you know, the, the idea here is I'm, I'm struggling, I might say that I'm struggling myself with coming to terms and how to explain um, the, the nuances of these different words. And I, unfortunately, I think it really depends on the particular person who is um, uh, giving a, a definition to these concepts. But <clears throat> in any case, <clears throat> thanks for giving me the opportunity um, to point that out. Uh, so, <clears throat> so uh, to uh, talk about, to continue th th this discussion from um, a more or less clinical perspective. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a phrase that some counselors use, honor the resistance. Uh, resistance, what's that? Non-consciously motivated defense mechanism. And this is something that all therapists encounter. Um, and it's a natural reaction that takes various, various manifestations. And the history we hear is that originally uh, when uh, Freudianism first developed, uh, resistance was considered something bad. It was considered, it meant that the uh, client or patient was not cooperating, that they we're trying to hide something and you know, resistance more or less had negative connotations to it. But more recently, the idea is that resistance is part of the healing process. I mean, re resistance allows us to see more clearly what the person is struggling with. Resistance gives the therapist and the client an opportunity to con confront certain non-conscious material more directly. So rather than dismissing resistance, as a, a type of self-deception, therapists should recognize it as a behavior that if properly handled can lead to productive outcomes. And of course the challenge is to figure out how to handle it um, more productively. Um, and just some examples of resistance. And <clears throat> I give these examples, again, uh, we're all familiar with these things, not just because um, uh, you know, this does not apply just to people who may be diagnosed with a mental disorder um, or someone who's in counseling sessions. You know, th this is true for all of us all the time, I think, right? So, you know, we're having a conversation with someone in our family or a good friend, or whatever, we're upset about something, you know, we all engage in, uh, as you can see, this is quite a long list, sarcasm, insensitive jokes, rudeness, incivility, uh, we, we begin to argue with people. It's not clear what, what's the other person, what, what's bothering us. We express hostility. We overreact to minor slights. Inappropriate humor can be a type of resistance to having a meaningful discussion with a loved one about something sensitive. Re reticence, we're overly reserved. Uh, we're late to a meeting, late to a, a family engagement because we don't really like we don't want, want to see our relatives. Um, clients are often late to uh, sessions. Uh, that may be a sort of unconscious type of resistance, emotionally absent, forgetting things on a regular basis. Um, and then one thing that I've had, uh, I, when I used to work for a facility, I used to have to do a lot of group work and there would be uh, clients who would just talk too much, steal the spotlight, 
attempt to control the direction of discussion or they would change the topic. And it was sort of like playing whack-a-mole, you know, trying to shut down one discussion, um, you know, the, the shut down one client who was talking too much. And then when I would handle that, another client would steal the spotlight and then he or she would start talking a lot. So, you know, th those, not necessarily, but quite often, of course, those are all examples of um, resistance. Uh, some other examples, responding with superficial answers, challenging the group leader, omitting possibly relevant information, shifting attention, deflection, providing overly abstract, intellectualized answers, preface, prefacing statements with qualifiers, I agree, but, um, body language, where one sits in the room, or if one's words are incongruent with one's gestures or uh, countenance or demeanor. So these are all examples. And again, I'm showing these examples because these are things that happen not just among clients um, seeking mental health care, they, they happen uh, out in the everyday world, right? We, many of us engage in these behaviors and the idea is to sort of look at our own behavior uh, for, for purposes of growth, personal self-growth and say, uh, am I resisting? Am I trying to avoid a, a discussion with a loved one here? Um, for whatever reason. So to sort of wrap things up, um, and again, this is uh, a bit, uh, this is a little bit difficult because, you know, these words, as I said before, they're used in slightly different ways, unconscious, subconscious, preconscious. Um, it gets a little bit confusing. Uh, there really is no set scientific way to talk about psychology. Um, you know, in, in the same way, 150 years ago, the first physicists were not talking about quarks and neutrons and subatomic particles. I mean, there just wasn't, those concepts did not really exist yet. Uh, and, and I think um, many of us are struggle. Anytime we try to talk about psychology, it becomes a real challenge uh, because of the, the concepts can be a little bit difficult to pin down, a little bit fluid. But in any case, this is my attempt to come up with what I call three types of consciousless mentation, three types. So the first type is uh, underground mentation, the inaccessible architecture of the mind. You might say offstage to use a theatrical metaphor. So uh, the, these are things that we just cannot be conscious of. We can study, for, for example, the way neurons interact with each other. We can't really be conscious of that. We can be conscious of knowledge about the way our neurons interact. But that actual interaction is completely inaccessible to the human psyche. We can only be indirectly aware of it. Um, so this gets into a, a kind of a sticky philosophical debate, I think. But in any case, just for the sake of argument, um, I'll introduce the first type of consciousless mentation. The second type, quarantine, non-conscious um, material, uh, uh, dissociated content. This more or less describes the Freudian unconscious. It's linked to the past, childhood events and experiences, um, it, it, often something traumatic. And the idea here, <clears throat> for Freud at least, a boiling cauldron of unacceptable or unpleasant memories, untoward urges, or unresolved conflict, often within the family. So this is what we might call the backstage of cognition and is only accessed with great difficulty uh, usually, of course, in a clinical setting. So that's the, uh, the second type. And then um, the third type, consciousness material, but it's accessible. We might throw in the uh, pre-conscious here. This is another Freudian term. This is a sort of mental waiting room consisting of anything that could potentially be brought into conscious awareness. We might, again, to continue with the um, uh, <clears throat> uh, theatrical uh, me metaphor upstaged. So these are unrepressed memories. They're memories, but they're not necessarily um, on the front burner that we extract for specific purpose and constitute background cognition. Okay. 
Well, I think um, I'm going to stop there. And uh, if anyone has uh, any questions, of course, I'd be more than happy to. Uh... Wonderful. Um, all right. Uh, can we stop sharing the screen? Sure. All right. Um, so, folks, uh, it's time for questions. Uh, as always, we have the four rules. Type exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask a question. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. And number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anything and do some courtesy. First up is going to be Phil. Phil, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, what I want to ask is using the iceberg metaphor. Uh, I was interested in what Augustine said, that there's this is a deep, bottomless fathom of unknowns in, in our interior. So I'm talking about the interior versus exterior. I'm curious how psychotherapy actually works in this sense, because it seems to me you could explore it in one sense from the exterior, as you talked about studying neural reactors and so forth, but that's exteriority that does not necessarily talk about consciousness itself. So in a sense, you then have to go into the interior. And the problem with the interior, even if you're a psychotherapist and very, very knowledgeable and very open, uh, and you took a very deep dive and, and, and you, you've gotten very, very deep, maybe not to the bottom, but very, very deep. How do you talk to uh, the, the person who, who you're talking to? Because if we accept the fact that every individual is unique to a certain degree, even though we talk about humanity in general, then in a sense, the best you could do, even with your gray experience of your own interiority, is that the best you could do is what I would term parallel processing, which, which is the misuse of the language, but nonetheless parallel processing in which you lay on your experience to the other experience. And the best you could do in a sense, even though it's kind of unknown where you are is you have this sort of secret way of leading, even though in, in somewhat generalized way, you could lead the person to through the subconscious out to maybe the pre-conscious and, and so forth. But, but in some sense, all you could do is because you, you have a very loose handle in which you could only lead and they themselves must be aware of this, not that you will tell them what it is because that would be exterior. So the most you could do is coax them out of this thing and in coaxing them, there's still the problem is that you are generalizing because if you're, if you're generalizing in some sense, all you could do is kind of almost stereotype these typical sort of situation to this unique individual in which you all could do is be somewhat ambiguous. How do you actually coax an individual who has very unique problems, unique experiences and you, you, nonetheless, you had at best generalize in a, in a kind of stereotypical way to bring them into consciousness. Okay, so that's a, um, that's a good question. That's a very big question. Um, I don't think there is one way uh, to do that. Um, I think what you're talking about is <clears throat> the difference between, or the, how do you strike a balance between directive therapy and non-directive therapy? And of course, originally going back to um, uh, uh, the, the beginnings of what we might call classical psychodynamic Freudian therapy, you know, uh, 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 some people um, said, well, the, um, we, have to be, we have to be directive. The patient doesn't really know what they're saying, um, and the, the uh, and then some people took the position: well, the patient is using symbols. They're talking about what happened in a dream, or they're they keep going back to the same topic, but that topic symbolizes something that happened in their past. And so the question is: to what degree 
should a therapist jump in and interpret those symbols? And, you know, more recently, you know, maybe since the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know, th th there is this uh, what we might call a Rogerian point of view, Carl Rogers point of view, where the role of the therapist is really not to be directive, not to say anything, to just let the client go on and on and let the client figure out what is bothering him or her. And so I, I don't think there is a, um, I, I don't think one way is better than the other. I think it really depends on the situation. So for example, I've had, I, I, I've had clients who were uh, sexually abused, physically abused. And it seems to me that that's what the problem is. And during the intake, I'll ask them, what do you want to talk about? You know, you, you, you wrote down that you were sexually abused. Uh, do you want to make that uh, uh, a presenting issue? Do you want to discuss that in therapy? And he or she will say, no, I don't. I'm okay with it. I want to talk about what's happening now to me, you know, the problems with my in-law or, or I'm suffering from depression, whatever. And so, you know, my, my, it's just my personal bias. I always say, well, okay, we'll do that. Whatever the idea is, you know, should you put the uh, client in the pilot seat or not? And, you know, the way I was trained, sort of a more postmodern idea, I suppose, is you always put the, the uh, client in the pilot seat. But at the same time, uh, you know, I say to myself, maybe this person is in self-denial. Maybe that trauma is the cause for this person's depression and maybe something has to be processed there but they don't want to do it and I can't force them and so you know you you basically have two personalities and so the challenge as I said you know you it's it's a big question it's an important question I'm not sure exactly um I'm not always clear uh and to me I'm not always clear how to strike that balance between a uh, more directive versus a non-directive um, type of therapy. I'm, and again, I'm just speaking for myself, you know, because there are so many other counselors and they have their own approach. They have their own biases, how they do things. Um, but I, I suspect that most people these days try to strike some uh, type of balance. Um, and, um, and, and that's why sometimes therapy works and some, sometimes it doesn't, I, I suppose, is because sometimes people have a problem, but they're not consciously registering what that problem is. And they would prefer to talk about something else that's bothering them. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but- um, Phil, yeah. do you have a quick follow-up question? Yeah, it, it, it's a little bit askew, but, but it is, it's important because I talk about this parallel processing in a sense. Uh, music is a very, very deep, understanding of the interior as far as I'm concerned. And it, it has this symbol as language, which is sort of vague enough that it could cover that. But I see when I listen to music, I feel that in one sense, I understand in a general way what the composer is do, doing, perhaps not in terms of the articulation of the notes, but in the feeling that it carries. But I could never be sure how close I am to that thing. In other words, there is a parallelism I will follow, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. And it seems to me like if I was to leave somebody out of this cavern through music, in a sense, all I could do is sort of like lead in a certain way that is sort of like slippery and they have to still come out of it. So therefore that looseness of not being precise in the articulation, in the connection, uh, becomes Thank to you. me a problem. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, go ahead, Brian. Do you have a yeah, comment? I, I, um, I think you're right. I mean, there's not too much I, I could add to that, um, except to say that it's always a dance, you might say, uh, be, between the, uh, um, the client and the therapist. I mean, you, you have two personalities and uh, the idea, I mean, uh, the, the, the key term here, of course, is therapeutic alliance. And that supposedly is one of the most important common factors in why therapy works. 
So the challenge is how do you establish, how do you build a therapeutic alliance where you have both the, the client and the therapist working toward the same goals? Um, and so there, there has to be an honesty uh, on uh, both parts. And the therapist has to view his or herself as, uh, as, as, a, as a healing tool. And uh, that, that's a challenge. And that, that, that's not always easy to do. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Dave, Dominique, and Jean. Dave, go ahead. Thanks, Shikhan. And thank you, Brian, a wonderful presentation. I look forward to this journey. And I really want to celebrate your idea of working on self-development. Um, to me, we're in a society or strata. And uh, I know in previous meetups, we talked about people being born into the top level of Maslow's pyramid. Uh, you know, through good fortune, you know, we might call ourselves elites or intellectual or whatever. And we're fortunate enough, to, we can work on the self-development stuff. And the thing is, the people in the lower part of the pyramid, you know, the essential workers and the poor and the homeless, they're not bad people, but they just don't have the opportunity. And I'll give an example. Uh, I ran into a concept called co-counseling a few years ago, and I participated for a while, very interesting. And it was apparently discovered by a guy working in the docks of Seattle. And he was talking to a coworker who was having a problem. And the, they kind of interviewed each other and talked back and forth. And they both got better. And, you know, it's amazing. It's, it's this thing that, you know, this people have potential everywhere. And so I'm curious how eventually this would hopefully be brought in like our education system, which is the only thing that we have, we all go through to, we all try to improve through, uh, but um, it's sounds like an interesting jury. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so that those are uh, important concepts, this idea of co-counseling. And what you said, basically, I think what you were talking about, um, uh, the first point you made is this, you know, Maslow's pyramid and how uh, it's really a, a socioeconomic issue uh, that people are, many of us are born into more privileged circumstances. And we're going to have the, the time, we're going to have the resources, the know-how uh, in order to heal ourselves or in order to grow personally, uh, um, where other people, because of their life circumstances, just don't have those resources. They just they don't have uh, those opportunities. And so um, that that I think you know there's there's always a political angle to any of these discussions, a political and economic uh, angle. Um, and so I don't really have an answer how to fix that problem, except to say that I would I think we increasingly need to view public health issue excuse me mental health problems as a public health issue. And of course that gets into um, the politics of gathering the resources of mobilizing people, uh, making sure that there are places and facilities for people who are less privileged, um, places where they can go and to get the support uh, that they need. And, uh, you know, and that, that is a, of course a huge a huge order, uh, but I, it's the same thing with substance use disorders, you know, so we can view someone who is struggling with cocaine addiction or alcoholism, whatever it is, we can view that as an individual problem, or we can view it as a public health issue. And even though viewing it as a public health issue is a very expensive way to view it and a very politically charged way to view it, we have to ask in the long run, which way the individual needs help or society needs help is going to um, help everybody. And I, I, you know, this, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing individual counseling. That's, I, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, is, should we use the lens of individual or the lens of public health to view our problems in our society? And I think many times we, we have to view things as, as a public health issue whether it's substance uh, abuse issues or mental health. So uh, again, I don't have any answers on how to do that. But, you know, I'm just presenting more of a, a general philosophy in, in my own opinion on that. But you know, the, the longer I've 
dealt with these issues, it seems to me that there's a lot we can be doing outside of an individual session um, to, um, uh, to, to, to help people. Yeah, this is a very interesting point that Dave brought up because there is, I think, something in the middle. Like when you have that worker talking to their coworkers or people talking to their family members or friends. Now that's not exactly counseling. Right. And it's not individual either. Right. But, you know, and this, uh, Carl Rogers is very big on this, this idea of authentic relating. If you actually relate in an authentic way to another human being, that is actually therapeutic for both individuals. Yes. Simply by, you know, because it, it, this is the point that um, Bill Rowe was making about how children learn conscious interiority from the parents. So it's actually, you know, when you speak things out and you see that the other person doesn't get you or the other person is coming from something else, it gives you an opportunity of raising up your conscious interiority because yes. you are trying to communicate it to another human being. So just kind of a good, authentic relating to people who care about each other seems to be a middle tier as compared to just purely individual uh, or kind of at the societal level. What do you think? Yes, um, I, I think you're. I think you're right. Um, so the challenge is, how do we cultivate that sort of middle tier? Um, and uh, I think a lot of it, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is education, um, teaching children uh, earlier on how to express their negative emotions. That it's okay to have negative emotions. What's important is how do you express them in in school. Uh, something that's been in the news a lot lately, of course, is the police how to reform the, the police. So the next time that they confront someone who is having a schizophrenic episode or suffering from bipolar or whatever, um, you know, it won't lead to someone getting shot or seriously injured. Uh, and, and of course, you know, some people are a little uncomfortable with that. Some people say, look, the job of the police is not to be social workers. But I think there's a middle ground that doesn't mean that they should not have, have at least some basic training on how to recognize, hey, there's a chance this person is having a mental breakdown. How do we deal with it? Let's not assume that, you know, he, he, he's a criminal. Um, so there, there are some practical things, uh, I think, that increasingly we're beginning to recognize and, and talk about. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Dominique, followed by Jean. Dominique. Well, hello, Shukran, Dr. Ryan. Dr. Ryan, always uh, a delight to hear your presentation. So therefore, thank you for taking the time thank to you. talk to us today. So uh, my question goes around the comps of the two tire emotions that you briefly mentioned, um, specifically the dynamic between uh, the first tire to the second tire. And, and this reminds me of the concept of the Stoic philosophy that says, like, for example, it's not the event that made you angry, but your opinion about the event that made you angry. So I wonder what recommendations or suggestions there is from this James philosophy or how to better manage those tired two emotions that are counterproductive. Or even so, actually, to using anger as an example again, to sort of like keep it on that first tire, like sort of box it over there and not let it trickle to tire two where it might become harder to deal with. So, I don't know. Okay. Um, yes, thank you for your question. So, I, you, you, it was, you kind of broke up a little bit, but I think I understand what you're asking. So, um, if, if I don't, please uh, correct me. But, um, so you're talking about tier, uh, the, tier one and tier two um, emotions, this sort of Jamesian view of what emotions actually are. And I think you're asking, how can we... Uh, better deal with tier two emotions or come to terms with what they mean um, from a practical point of view, interpersonal relations, whether it's a clinical setting or not a clinical or outside uh, the clinical office. Um, well, I'll tell you uh, one, one thing I like to do um, when I meet somebody for the first time is uh, hand out uh, an emotion word inventory. And you can get these anywhere. Uh, and I 
tell people, look, I know that you're a native English speaker and you know what these words are. There's maybe 50 words on this list, but how often do you actually use these words when you're talking about your emotions? Because what happens with emotions, especially at the second level, tier two, they become very wrapped up in other emotions, very much wrapped up in other thoughts. And we have a problem disentangling what we're actually feeling, what we're actually thinking. And so if we can educate people, and this is not a difficult thing to do, if we can educate people to be more sensitive to the vocabulary they use to express their sentiments, to express their emotions, especially when they're upset, um, that will increase interpersonal communication and it, it will sort of disarm the other person. So instead of saying, I'm pissed off at you, you can say something like, I'm a little disappointed in what you did. I'm a little uncertain as to why you did that. That sounds a little more inviting to have a dialogue. So I always, uh, I often begin that when I meet someone for the first time, you know, let's, let's talk about the words you actually use. It has nothing to do with one's level of education. It has more to do with a habit that, that we just get into, that I'm mad, that's how I feel. And, and because when I think I'm mad, I say I'm mad, that word determines how I act and react. But if I sit down and look at a list of words, I can choose more carefully the words I actually verbalize. And then that changes my whole thought pattern. I'm not mad at that person. I'm just disappointed in them. That's a very different discussion. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's sort of a, a practical thing, I think. Because remember, at the tier two, it becomes very complicated. Because what happens is emotions and thoughts start drawing in all types of meanings. They start recruiting other associations that may not really be useful to um, what I really want to articulate, what I really want to verbalize. So we have to learn how to get in touch with what we're actually feeling. I mean, it sounds like a cliche to get in touch with what we're actually feeling, but I do think that it's very important. Uh, there was one more aspect of Dominic's question. Uh, you know, he referred to Stoic philosophy and the big point in Stoic philosophy is that there is a situation and then there is your evaluation of situation. And what happens is that you have to look at, you have to be aware of your evaluation. It's, it's kind of saying, okay, this is the situation and this is my evaluation of it. And that's what you react to. So that's like one, you know, it's like two, two tier way oh. of looking at evaluations. And he was asking whether there is parallels of that way of looking in 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 uh, Jainian way of looking at emotions. Yes, uh, in fact, you know, so we, I, you know, James talks about one tier, two tier. I think we can talk about three tier, four tier, five tier. I think it goes on forever, quite frankly, the way the mind works. And I, I won't go into it too much. I'll just mention um, this. It relates to how metaphors work. This idea of meta framing. So the idea, the mind never stands still. The mind is constantly meta framing. It's always going up one level, one level, one level. And not, not to get too technical with changing in terms, but this idea of the I. So the I is constantly being recreated, sort of like the Buddhist self, and it's always looking down. And the more, if we're in a situation that's emotionally charged, if we can sort of step out and remove our I from that situation and look at it more objectively, more carefully, chances are we're going to have a better understanding of what's going on. And so this, again, it relates this concerns the relationship between the I and the me and this idea of uh, the meta framing. Um, and, and, and as I said, I think the mind is always meta framing, but sometimes we get stuck at one in one frame at one level and we don't move. We don't adapt. We don't move uh, beyond. So we always have to be open to new experiences. Excellent. I mean, in Stoic philosophy, there is the idea of view from above, which is very similar to the in, you know, conscious interiority. You're kind of looking at yourself from above. That's how right. they, they visualize it. But it's the same thing of saying you're looking at yourself inside your mind. You are seeing what you're doing. And that gives you the distance from being caught up in whatever it is that you're, you're caught up. And so it's right. an analogous uh, tool. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Gene followed by Phil. Gene. 
Yeah, uh, quite fascinating discussion. So I, I have two questions because I have one. I heard all you guys' discussion. <laughs> I have another one. Please. And I wonder, you know, because this, uh, because, uh, my experience is different from Dave because um, a lot of people I know around me, they are not financially depraved. They actually have a lot of money, but it seems they're not really interested in consciousness somehow. They're more interested in fishing, crabbing, you know, vacationing. <laughs> so, so I think that's another, so I don't, I think uh, there's a different reasons people are not interested in consciousness or further look into it, you know, um, financial just part of it. Another thing I see, uh, I see a lot of high school girls I know from my sister's daughter and my friend's daughter, they all have anxiety and uh, depression. I realize a lot of young girls are have very challenging this society without much guidelines from religions before, now we don't have, and they all go to counseling and it helps them a lot. And I see it's like you mentioned, it's not just individual problem. It seems maybe it's more societal problem. And like Shokan mentioned, you know, to solve this problem, maybe we have to tackle in all three different levels. You know, both individual levels have counseling, then the group levels in community, you know, group learning, like 12 steps, whatever. And then on societal level, you know, education and policies. Because I know in the societal level, it takes much longer time. Usually it's too late already, you know, mm -hmm. try to survey. So I think that's maybe an option because I see individual level, if your family have money, you can hire a counseling. Then, then the family don't have money or, you know, understanding they can't afford it. Then their kids may suffer more. But anyway, so that's what I, I'm thinking. My main question is this subconsciousness, pre-consciousness and consciousness. So I wonder if that... As a therapist, do you have the training so you actually get in deeper into your subconsciousness and pre-consciousness so you can really help other, like a guide, you know, like you have been to the mountain Rainier, for example, other people trying to climb mountain Rainier, they have to have some guide to help them. And as you said, I agree, you know, other people have to be the driver because it's their exploration. You know, if you, you help them, then they you they have to constantly rely on outside they didn't really learn the tools to do themselves it's more like dependency so i think maybe physical uh, therapy is more like the guide help them to explore their you know their mountain rainier or whatever you know their subconsciousness do you think that's the correct understanding um yes um uh, i uh... I do, uh, and, and before I answer that, just to go back to a couple uh, other points you made that I think are important. So you have this idea of consciousness and you know, most people, you know, when they hear the word, what does, what does that have to do with me? And I just wanna go out, enjoy myself, fishing, be with my family and make money. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the way, I think the issue is the challenge is to talk about consciousness in a very concrete way and to break it down into different things and different experiences. And um, we don't have to go into a, a detail about that now, but I, I just mentioned it because I think that's a very important point you brought up because when people hear the word consciousness, it's sort of like the unconscious or subconscious. It sounds very mysterious and people have their own definitions of what it means. And so we, in the pra for practical applications, the challenge is to figure out how to make it specific sounding and how to make it concrete so it relates to people at an everyday level. Then the other thing you said about many young women suffering from anxiety, that's true. Um, and uh, this idea of, um, uh, men, of, we've talked about before, of mental health as not, an, not just an individual problem, but a, a societal or a public health challenge. And uh, I, just a little, just a, a, a little antidote. So when I first started to go into mental health, about maybe six, seven years ago, I was in a program that emphasized what they called community psychology. And I really wasn't big on the idea because to me, I had this very restricted vision of what psychotherapy, what counseling was all about. And you went into a room with one person and you try to fix their problem. And it was none of my business what happened outside the office, in the community, 
you know, it sounded a little too socialist for me, this idea of community psychology. But now I realize that actually all psychology is community psychology in a sense. And that for those of us who are not as privileged, community psychology has a crucial role to play. And so, um, you know, and that can mean different things. For example, in schools, making sure teachers are informed about different mental health challenges that students face, like young women and anxiety or eating disorders, whatever. They don't have to be, the teachers don't have to be trained in counseling, but they should at least have exposure to knowledge that will inform them that when they see a problem, they know who to contact. Uh, so the, the point I'm making here is community psychology, um, I, I think uh, has a very big role to play in our society. Uh, and then also uh, this idea about the, the third point you brought up was about um, should, should a counselor be guiding a, uh, a client or a patient through their ex exploration of their unconsciousness? And yes, most definitely. Uh, so the idea, the words, we're supposed to use the word facilitate. So the role of ideally the counselor is to facilitate um, the patient's own journey. Of course, it depends. I mean, there is always a time, I think, when uh, a counselor should be a little more directive rather than non-directive. It really depends on what is happening. I mean, if a client is in crisis and they come to see you and they should really be in a psychiatric ward, I mean, obviously that, that is a time when you have to be very directive. Um, or if they're su suffering a bipolar manic uh, episode or something, uh, that you're going to have to be more directive. But many times, ideally, I think we should be non-directive and view ourselves as someone uh, who is just helping the client explore what problems they have. So in any case, I'll, I'll, I'll end there for that. Uh, thank you. Next up is Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. Brian, a great presentation as always. And I, I always walk away from your presentations with something really important uh, that is either affirmed or that I learned. Um, I just wanna, uh, I, I, in, in my family, there are both teachers and psychotherapists. And um, so the, uh, the awareness uh, on part of the, um, of the teachers is, is, uh, is guided in some way by the enlightenment that they get from the, from the therapists in our family. And this use of metaphors is so powerful. And um, one of, a couple of the favorite ones in our family uh, are the ones like from Forrest Gump. You know, he says, mom always used to say, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get, you know. It's a, it's a wonderful little metaphor, you know, or that a relationship is like a garden, you know, with seeds and nurturing and water and fertilizing and tilling the soil and responding to events and weeds will come up that will need to be picked. It's just expect it. It's just a part of having a garden. And it's true about relationships with, between individuals and it's true about the culture of any group. And, and that these are, and it's a growing, you know, live kind of metaphor. So those metaphors are, are so powerful, you know, they give people kind of comfort as well as guidance, as well as even a, a way to talk with each other um, that might otherwise be more difficult. And uh, I just think that, you know, you're, you're wading into an incredibly powerful and, uh, and underappreciated subject here. Thank you, thank you. Um... So yeah, just a, a quick response to what you said, um, you, you know, and I think the idea here about metaphors is to always have an open mind and to listen to the metaphors other people use. And I just one very quick uh, antidote. When I was training, I was at a um, substance use uh, re rehab facility and one of the clients had relapsed. And of course, in substance use relapse is a very common occurrence. And some of the other interns were very upset that this um, client had gone back out on the streets and was using drugs. And um, our supervisor 
was trying to cheer us up or not cheer us up, but sort of put it in perspective. And she said, look, I know that you all tried hard to help this individual. Your job is not to save this person. Your job as counselors is to, to use an agricultural metaphor, is to plant a seed in that person's head. And this time the seed did not take, the person relapsed, but maybe in the future that seed is still there and they won't relapse again but you have to begin somewhere and just view it as planting seeds. And it really cheered everybody up. You know, I know it cheered me up. Um, and that just that one simple metaphor really reframed my uh, experience of what substance use treatment is all about. Wonderful. Next up is Phil followed by Jean. Phil. Yeah, I, I wanted to make a comment on, on Brian's uh, thing about dance and then, uh, uh, so Secret, you, you, you talk about the middle ground. And it's like, I'm going to mention a, a, a very important movie, The Taxi Driver. It's a very disturbing movie, actually. Oh, Phil, just keep it short. That's it. Okay. It's a very disturbing movie. This guy, you know, the, this guy had a traumatic experience and he went to the taxi company to talk to the wise man. And of course, in the dance, the parallel processing, they were doing completely different dances, mm. okay? Uh, but because he went to a person he trusted who was willing to talk, even though he didn't know what the hell he's talking about. And at the end, he, uh, he left and he says, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, but thanks a lot anyways, right? And so there was something else communicating about the relationship that affirmed that things will be okay, maybe, even though they were dancing completely different dances. So that relationship in the middle ground of interaction, because as a friend, you always have something to say, even if you said the wrong thing in the right context. So therefore, I want you to say something about that, because that seems like a very interesting thing that even if you're dancing the wrong dance, the fact that you're willing to dance, it's a very assurance that allows things to uh, continue. Right, right. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that. And yeah, that movie, I haven't seen that in, in a while with Jodie Foster, Robert De Niro. It is a disturbing movie. And yeah. it was, I think, made in the 70s, but it's still so relevant for what's going on in our society for different reasons. So this idea of, and that, that's a powerful idea. Uh, that even though we're doing different dances, we're not really connecting, but at a deeper, very human level, we are connecting. And I would describe that connection with a very simple word. Uh, I would use the word presence. And that sometimes someone comes to see us, whether it's a clinical setting or not a clinical setting, just a, a friend who is troubled, a family member who's troubled by something, we can't solve the problem for them. They, they don't know what they're going to do. But just being in the same room can give a person tremendous hope. And the, as I said, it's just one word, presence. But I think that presence is so powerful because it's rooted in almost a, a human instinct you know, that, that I call uh, social affiliation, that we need social connection. We need to be affiliated with other people. And there's something in our psyche that is evolved, I think, that once we're in the presence of somebody, even though the problem may not go away, they don't understand us, but it inspires hope in the mind of the troubled person because we're just built that way as social beings. So I think that's a very good point. Excellent point, Phil. Uh, thank you. Next up is going to be Patricia followed by Jean. Patricia. Yes, I just, I wanted, this reminded me what Brian just said about presence, what we were talking about last night with Martin Buber, just that human experience and that connection of being there for someone. And to go back to what Phil said about, you know, maybe you're not dancing the same dance. You know, maybe that person's just not ready to hear that message yet. And I think that in a therapeutic relationship, a lot of times, you know, whether you're you know, the client might need to talk about something, but they're not ready. 
So maybe you put a seed, like Jeff said, in their head, and maybe later they'll be able to process it. But just being there and open to listening or experiencing something with somebody is just an extremely powerful thing. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Yeah, so just quickly, you know, to respond uh, to, to what you said and just sort of elaborate a little bit. So, you know, when we do intakes or an a, a, a psychosocial assessment, that's a very important question that should be asked is, okay, you're here, you have a problem, you're going to leave my office in about 50 minutes. I want to know what type of social support you have, because between now and next week, that social support, whether it's family, friends, someone in the community, a church, whatever it is, that social support can be very important in getting you through uh, between now and the next time we meet. So yes, th th this idea of social support cannot be underestimated. And this all relates to this idea that we've mentioned before of uh, the importance of the uh, community psychology, getting the resources um, to, to, to have community psychology because community, uh, whether the facilities or um, group homes, whatever they are, the idea is that they can offer um, individuals social support. Wonderful. Uh, so last question from Jean. Jean. Yeah, Brian. Uh, so I really like you mentioned about this community way of healing. And I see analogy between psychology, the way, you know, like when you treat individual patient, just like you use Western medicine, you know, you treat the symptom, but then you don't treat the source. So then they keep coming to you, then you can never finish it. So like Eastern medicine, you try to find the source of the problem. Why developed the country have so many mental health issues, so many people take drugs, you know, and maybe there's a, also, I see, you know, like the blue, uh, I think there's a called a blue something like about 12 people, uh, 12 uh, location in the world, people live the longest and they find all the common things between them. And one is, like you said, small community, the family support, there's three generation family live together. You know, all these things make people live longer and they have religion and they have working. So I think in our country right now, because of the industrial revolution, people are forced to isolate the family not living together. They don't have social support and then they lost religion. So they lost community. I think that's kind of, I see that's part of the problem and then they don't treat the source, then <laughs> they have more and more people and they don't, they used to talk to their pastor. Now they all go to psychiatrists to talk to yeah. them. So that's what we see, I think it's a problem. Yes, yes. Yeah, so that what you just, the last point you made, I think is historically uh, makes a lot of sense. So it used to be if someone had a um, some sort of psychological emotional disturbance it may may not have been a clinically diagnosable issue but something they were struggling with they went to the rabbi their iman a priest uh, a shaman some sort, sort of holy holy man or whatever um, and would talk out their problems or they would talk out their problems with their family and you know many times these psychological disturbances because they have that social support would 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 uh, would resolve themselves and they would not need heavy duty intervention. I mean, of course, there are some uh, uh, cl clinical issues where we do need medication, um, but, you know, you can certainly make the argument, may, perhaps we're over medicated, you know, we're over medicating people and maybe they just need more uh, talk therapy um, b before we jump to the conclusion that they need medication. Um, and so you know, the idea here is, as you said, um, uh, you know, in modern times, I, 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 I don't think it's just an American thing. I think all over the world, because of modernization, post-industrialization, so, so our, our societies are being increasingly fragmented. Um, we're reducing society to the individual. The individual has become the basic unit uh, of what it means to be a person. <laughs> But what it means to be a person is so much richer and greater than just the individual. But that's how we view uh, societies. And, and you know, not, as I said, not just the United States. I, I think it's um, 
uh, the more uh, it's sort of the downside of postmodernization, this idea of increasingly expanding the freedoms of the individual, but there's a price we pay for that, which is probably more uh, mental health issues. Wonderful. All right, folks. Uh, so Brian, thank you very much. I'm really, really looking forward to this series. Uh, today was uh, just kind of the kickoff. Uh, you just laid out a whole bunch of uh, kind of principles and the directions in which we can go. And we are, I'm really looking forward uh, to, the spirit, uh, to the series. We'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Um, Bye thank you, Ran, very much. Bye. Um, and folks, um, I would recommend a meetup tomorrow at 2.30. We are going to be talking about orality and literacy. We're going to be talking about how language works, how human communication works, and how it is the back and forth. It is kind of similar to the idea that we talked about uh, yesterday, the I, thou idea. Uh, we're, it's also very similar to various meetups that we have done on, on language. Um, so that's going to be at 2.30 Eastern time tomorrow. Uh, so thank you very much. See you soon. Bye.